All right, welcome to the emergency room, where we're going to talk about shock. Now, the emergency room is quite an appropriate place to talk about shock, because shock is a medical emergency. It's a critical condition brought on by the sudden drop in blood flow through the body. Now, there are various causes of shock, and each of these causes have their own parameters. And in this video, we're going to talk about those parameters, and we're going to make it super easy and super simple. We are going to be talking about cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, distributive shock, and obstructive shock. Let me just make one more point to make shock extremely easy and simple. For each of these etiologies of shock, there is always going to be one primary parameter which we focus on, because it's that parameter which is primarily driving the shock. If you focus on this one parameter, it will make the entire topic of shock super easy and super simple. And with this introduction, let us begin. So we have cardiogenic shock. In cardiogenic shock, there is some underlying pathology that damages the heart. Often, it's an MI, a myocardial infarction, but it can also be due to a ruptured valve, cardiomyopathy, or some other heart pathology. For this video, let's stick to the most common cause, MI, myocardial infarction. So, in cardiogenic shock, of course, there's going to be decreased cardiac output because the heart simply can't get as much blood out. So this is the parameter that we want to focus on in cardiogenic shock, that there will be reduced cardiac output. This reduced cardiac output will be responsible for all the changes that we see in cardiogenic shock. For example, now that there's reduced cardiac output, the heart will try to compensate by increasing heart rate. And similarly, SVR, systemic vascular resistance, will be increased. Increased SVR, i.e. vasoconstriction of the veins, is another compensatory mechanism due to the decreased cardiac output. And the body actually responds this way to help preserve blood flow to vital organs. So SVR is increased, and CVP, central venous pressure, is also increased. And that's because, since the heart doesn't work, there's a forward failure of the cardiac pump, and this results in backup of blood within the venous side of the system. And the same thing goes for PCWP, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, it will be increased because blood can't get from the lungs into the heart properly because of all the pressure. And finally, the mixed venous oxygen saturation. This will be down because the cardiac output is not high enough to meet tissue oxygen demands, so blood returns to the right side of the heart with low oxygen concentration. So that's it for cardiogenic shock. Just remember, the main parameter is reduced cardiac output, and everything else logically flows. All right, next, hypovolemic shock. This is not a problem intrinsically with the heart. Here, there's just not enough fluid in the body. For example, which we often see in the emergency room, there's loss of fluid due to hemorrhage. For example, a person got shot with a gun, and now he has a hemorrhage, so he has reduced fluid in his body. Other causes of maybe diarrhea, vomiting, and dehydration, as well as other etiologies. But in all forms of hypovolemic shock, there's one parameter that we want to focus on. Think about it. There's reduced fluid in the body. There's reduced blood. And therefore, the problem is in the preload on the heart. That is, the central venous pressure. Central venous pressure is basically synonymous with preload. So when there's reduced fluid, there will be reduced preload, i.e. there will be low CVP. And this is the parameter that we want to focus on in hypovolemic shock. This is the beginning of the story of hypovolemic shock, and everything else naturally flows. Now, since preload will be low, of course cardiac output will be low, because the heart can only pump out as much as it gets. And logically, PCWP will also be low, because there's nothing blocking the blood from the lungs going to the heart. But now here, just like in cardiogenic shock, Due to the reduced cardiac output, there will be a compensatory increase in systemic vascular resistance, as well as in heart rate. Let's move on now to distributive shock. Distributive shock is when there's vasodilation, systemic vasodilation. And of course, when there's systemic vasodilation, then there will be reduced flow, reduced circulation, and that's what leads to the shock. Well, actually, let's just be a little bit more accurate. In sepsis and anaphylaxis, of course, there will be systemic vasodilation. But in neurogenic shock, the problem is in sympathetic tone. So the, so the body can't properly vasoconstrict, and therefore, it will indirectly vasodilate. But the point is the same, that in sepsis and anaphylaxis and neurogenic shock, these are distributive forms of shock because there's a systemic what we can call vasodilation. And when there's vasodilation, we don't have proper tissue perfusion of blood. 
Let's talk about each of these types of shock individually. But just keep in mind that for all three of them, the parameter that we want to focus on is the same, decreased systemic vascular resistance. And that's because again, as we mentioned, there's systemic vasodilation. So now, in sepsis, there's massive vasodilation, as I mentioned, but this is in response to infection, due to the release of cytokines by the white blood cells trying to fight off the infection, and nitric oxide release from the endothelial cells. In septic shock, cardiac output will be increased, because we have an infection around the body, and we want to address the infection, so therefore the body responds by increasing cardiac output, as well as heart rate. That's why people in sepsis have tachycardia, but central venous pressure and pulmonary capillary reg pressure will be decreased. And the reason is because of the systemic vasodilation. Now in septic shock, mixed oxygen venous saturation will actually be increased. The reasons beyond the scope of this video, but just keep that value in mind. Now let's move on to anaphylactic shock. In anaphylactic shock, we see, of course, again, a decrease in systemic vascular resistance due to vasodilation. This is an IgE-mediated type 1 hypersensitivity reaction with histamine release leading to the vasodilation. Now it's interesting that in anaphylaxis, as opposed to in sepsis, cardiac output will actually be decreased. And this is actually due to the fact that in anaphylaxis there's such a great vasodilation that there's a reduced venous return. There's not enough preload and therefore there's reduced cardiac output. And as a side note, a late finding in septic shock is actually reduced cardiac output as the body begins to die. All right, neurogenic shock. This could be due to, for example, trauma. And as we mentioned, there's loss of sympathetic tone the body simply can't vasoconstrict. So that's why it's a type of distributive shock. But neurogenic shock is also different than in septic shock because in septic shock, cardiac output is increased. And in neurogenic shock, due to decrease in sympathetic tone, cardiac output will be reduced. So that's it for distributive shock. Again, we want to focus on decreased SVR, systemic vascular resistance, due to the increased vasodilation. All right, let's move on now to obstructive shock. This is a broad term, but the basic idea is that there's an obstruction Something perhaps is squashing the heart, for example in cardiac tamponade, or in tension pneumothorax. Let's begin with cardiac tamponade, where the heart is being squashed. Since the heart is being squashed, cardiac output will be reduced. Well, of course, it's being strangled. And therefore, there will be a compensatory increase in heart rate, as well as systemic vascular resistance. Now, just like there's an obstruction in the outflow of the heart, there's also an obstruction in the blood trying to get back to the heart from the lungs because everything is squashed. And that's why PCWP, the pulmonary capillary edge pressure, will be increased in this form of obstruction. So in all of these conditions, only in cardiac tamponade and in cardiogenic shock will the PCWP be elevated. Keep that in mind. Let's move on now to tension pneumothorax. Here, there's pathology with the lungs, which leads to squashing of the preload, and therefore there will not be enough preload in the heart, reducing cardiac output. So the parameter that we want to focus on is CVP. CVP in this condition will be reduced because blood is not properly making its way back to the heart. And finally, last but not least, massive PE. The parameter that we want to focus on in PE is on pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. It will be reduced. And the point is that there is an embolism in the pulmonary artery, and that's what's blocking blood from getting back to the heart. So PCWP will be reduced, and that leads to everything else. For example, cardiac output will be reduced because it doesn't have enough preload since blood is blocked up in the lungs. But again, there will be a compensatory increase in systemic vascular resistance and heart rate, that's why in massive PE we see tachycardia, in order to make up for the reduced cardiac output. All right, so that's it for shock. I really hope you gained something from this video. Please leave your comments and take care.